I don't know what would have happened to my life if I'd stayed there, but if, you, if I had been able to stay there, I would have done so. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it wasn't to be. So I knew that um, it just needed to be, it, 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 there was something um, unresolved. Uh, there's a quote that featured in the film at one time by T.S. Eliot, uh, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started mm -hmm. and know the place for the first time. And I suppose I wanted to go back and see if I could know the place in it literally and in my and in my heart. I wanted to shake hands with the nine-year-old and I wanted to understand what my parents were going through. Go back to a place was the I often say it was the last time that I really knew who I was. That's what I felt. I was um, you know, the, as you can tell from the very brief part at the beginning of the movie, it sort of advertises, albeit through the heightened eyes of a nine-year-old, the notion that it, it takes a village to raise a child. Um, and I was very happy in that village. As she says in the bus, she says, you know, we know everybody in every house and every street, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not. I like it. Well, I liked it. I liked it. And I felt very secure. And when I left, I didn't feel that security again for a million years, it really? felt like. If I stayed from the perspective, sometimes physically, but creatively of a nine-year-old boy, then I didn't, didn't set myself the task of doing the impossible certainly for somebody like me, of writing a comprehensive film about the Troubles, but right. simply the idea of how it impacted significantly on one kid, one family, one street, when it was happening all over the place in much more tragic ways often. One of the first things he said was that, uh, are you familiar with the Scottish play? He'll never say the, the name, it's always mm -hmm. the Scottish play. Um, it's, um, uh, I learned that really quickly as well. For those who don't know, that is a play by Shakespeare about a Scottish king, first name of which begins with M, but we shouldn't really say it in a theatre because something horrible will happen to all of us. He's also very superstitious, as you might have gathered. <laughs> That's the Irish. <laughs> um, but um, Ken said uh, there is a, a psychological disorder called morbid jealousy. And um, the Scottish king suffered this, and I believe our character suffers from this. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to explore this. Uh, this is what I've been speaking to Pinter about. Um, and I'd be really interested in, in how we could find a way of uh, visualizing this. So kind of, well, that's got me not sleeping at night thinking about it. <laughs> because it's a really interesting thing to think about. And it's, yeah. um, it, it goes Back to kind of, I think, again, going back to my roots, I think there's such a, uh, in Cyprus, there's such a, it's it, both an English education and a Greek education that you get. And uh, they certainly, from the Greek side, infuse in you this kind of uh, the, the premise for the, like, you have to find the premise in a story. You have to find the, the reason that you need to go through the catharsis in the end. Like, what has this character undergone? And from day one, Ken seemed to always be talking about this kind of a process. And, um, and so I just found it fascinating to be able to try and contribute to that in a, in, in a way where we could just, still without kind of interrupting performances, but just um, giving a point of view. began to feel that there was a story there that maybe other people might recognize or identify with that was simply about displacement or about you know being a migrant in some way or um, uh, just dealing with traumatic change. Mm -hmm. uh, many people have that experience and also people whether they come from a you know relatively secure family environment which I did or whether they don't have that experience but maybe there was one moment in their life where there was a before, whatever that before was, um, of happiness or simplicity or something. Maybe some people don't even have that. But then there's the moment when you cross over, you know, a banal version would be when you find out Father Christmas isn't real or, or if, if that's in your culture or, or just when you are accelerated into an adulthood 
that maybe you're not ready for. Yeah. Um, and I thought also that, that I began to see ways in which that could look outwards rather than just looking inwards in terms of my experience. So um, I knew that the things that the nine-year-old who didn't understand politics had a view on were football, this girl Catherine, um, uh, religion, difficult, uh, <laughs> and, and movies, you know. Movies. So, and theater, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. theater just yeah. about, yeah. But that was my way, that was the, the, a, a way of understanding this little microcosmic world. Those 20 seconds where I heard something that I thought was maybe, you know, bumblebees or something, that's what I just remember very clearly. I thought, what is that sound? That sound is... And I, we live near a park, and I thought, is it, it can't be a bit big bee, is that a swarm of bees, is that a, and then sort of, and I did feel it all happening in slow motion in a very, very hot day, and then sort of like a film moment, just ratcheting down onto this swarm of, oh, it's not bees, it's people, shit, they're, com they're coming towards us. And then suddenly, and then it was happening, and then all these bizarre things, so, You'd think, seems like a silly thing to say, you'd think if you're going to come and mark the, mark the windows of Catholic houses, you might come with, already with sticks or whatever. But this thing of picking up the drains from the side of the road, so I thought, God, what an amazing effort to do that, but then break this wrought iron and use the wrought iron pieces to do that. And then there was this amazing silence after it all happened, and then the whole street came out, and then like a piece of magic all of the paving stones were gone. So that which we walked on, the solid ground on which we walked, was no longer there. The ground had officially been taken from beneath our feet, and now we were in this living metaphor of walking on sand. Sand that I didn't know was there, but it's shifting sand, and the very same symbols and actual physical manifestation of being settled had been lifted and was now in a pile at the end of the street, barricading you, from the rest of the world. So the, you know, you, you, that was incomprehensible that that, that that turnaround happened like that. It was like that. On one, one summer's day, the entire world turned upside down. In the end shot of Judy Dench, where she gives that little, those four lines that are sort of, you know, a sacrificial farewell, she must have stood there for five minutes and improvised again and again and again and again. And I kept throwing lines in and she was completely unthrown by it, happy to do it, um, stayed in it, kept that Mount Rushmore stillness. And then the funniest thing about that moment was, um, so we had been going for minutes and minutes and minutes. And, you know, I'm aware this is, in this case, it's an 85-year-old woman out in the sunshine. And I didn't, you know, and, and, you know, the lines were there. She said what I originally wrote. And then I said, do you mind if we just mess around with this for a bit, please? Because it's such a big moment. And, um, and, she, and she was playful. And we'd earned, we've worked a lot together. We earned that right to be playful. With respect, I threw things in. But the camera's running as well. So you're trying to keep a kind of, you keep it alive. She's happy to do that. And then eventually she landed on what you saw, and it was like a sort of bell tolling so beautifully. I said, cut, we've got it. I went straight to the monitor, picked up the headphones, said, play just those last, those last four lines. They played them, and I went, oh, no, 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 there's a no, oh, God, there's a terrible noise on the soundtrack. What is that? And Denise Yard, our sound recorder, said, that's you, sir, with your thrilled intake of breath. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> And that was me going, <gasps> because I was so thrilled by what she'd just done. It was like, you know, I don't know if you like sport. It was a baseball home run. It was, but it was Judy Dench, ladies and gentlemen, live on the film set, showing you what great acting is with stillness, profundity, heart, simplicity. Bang, finishes the movie. And I got overexcited. <laughs> um, so thanks to the glories of sound technology, they were able to take me away from that piece of her art. <laughs> and uh, what you see survives. That's great. That's great. Thank you.